Uh, hello, welcome once again to BipolarCast. This is a podcast where me and Matt Buziki speak to people with bipolar disorder who are using ketogenic metabolic therapy um, along with bipolar disorder. Today, we're very excited to be speaking to Dr. Shivani Seti. Uh, uh, Dr. Seti is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and founding director of the first academic metabolic psychiatry clinical program in 2015. She's double board certified in psychiatry and OBTC medicine and has additional experience in adult eating disorders. She completed her residency in psychiatry at Stanford University and specialized training in obesity at Duke Medical Center. Dr. Sethi received her MD jointly from Duke University School of Medicine and the National University of Singapore. She received a master's degree in biotechnology from John Hopkins University. Metabolic psychiatry is a term she coined to describe an emerging clinical discipline focused on the integrative study and treatment of metabolic abnormalities and the relationship to mental illness. Dr. Seti's approach to psychiatric treatment incorporates detection and treatment of metabolic abnormalities, principles of obesity medicine, nutrition, and metabolism. She was awarded funding by the Obesity Treatment Foundation and Buzuki Brain Foundation as a principal investigator to study the effectiveness of low carbohydrate ketogenic dietary intervention in outpatient cohort of patients with obesity or metabolic dysfunction overlapping with bipolar illness of schizophrenia. She's also a co-investigator on a pilot of a randomized con- uh, clinical uh, trial testing an FDA-approved obesity medication for binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa at Stanford University funded by Spark. She is a recipient of the Kun Lao uh, Bipolar Research Award and the Simmons Fellow Award for the Association of Women Psychiatrists for Innovation in Psychiatry and Contributions to Women's Health. <clears throat> she is a member of the Obesity Medicine Association and the American Psychiatric Association and serves on the Council of the Northern Californian Psychiatric Association. Um, you've got too many achievements. This is the longest intro we've ever done. So <laughs> that was uh, definitely the longest uh, amount of qualifications we've read on this show. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, I need some coffee to hear that bio. Thank you for that <laughs> long introduction. I think you read that off my Stanford profile. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for having me on the podcast today and also for both of you for um, doing this podcast and being so brave and courageous in describing your journeys and inviting people here to talk about uh, you know similar topics. So thank you for having me. Thank you. So you trained, um, you had a double, you have a double certification in obesity medicine and psychiatry. Um, what led you down this road? Because this is extremely uncommon. Well, let me down the road. Yeah, so, you know, I think it really goes back to my early days. And, you know, in in childhood, in um, at home, I grew up in an environment where food was, you know, nutrition was very valued and uh, thought of as important for health. And so I grew up in a family of the middle child of an older brother and a younger sister. Um, My mom made fresh food every day um, in a kind of traditional, um, you know, Indian culture. Um, She was taking care of the house, the kids. My dad was working. Um, My mom also worked too, but she was primarily taking care of, of us. And so, uh, food was, was very important. And I noticed that there was a lot of emphasis on that. In fact, my father had told me at a young age that fat is important. It's important for the brain. It's important for speed of neurotransmission. And he told me that when I was five, um, and he told me that there's something called myelin, um, around the, you know, neurons, the cells and insulated in myelin and, uh, that's fat. And in order for that to work, you need to have fat. So these concepts, I think, were something that I was exposed to early. And I valued that. And I think through my training, my dad was a scientist as well, and he went into business as well. But my grandfather was a surgeon. And um, I think that had an effect on me as well, because he also was very, uh, he very much focused on nutrition as well. Um, even though he's a surgeon. So I think that those things were just ingrained. Um, But as far as going into, you know, obesity and and psychiatry, I think that came later after my experiences in medical school. Um, And so what I noticed early in medical school, I noticed a theme that I felt was underappreciated in medicine. Uh, I felt that, you know, you, you have certain rotations and different subspecialties or specialties. And it felt very separate from each other. It felt a little bit, uh, we tend to silo ourselves in, in different fields. And 
what I noticed was that the rates of obesity and metabolic syndrome and uh, metabolic issues in general, the rates were really high in psychiatry. I saw that in, in mental illness. And they're a really high risk marginalized group in the epidemic of obesity itself. And we know that with mental illness, serious mental illness, on average, they die 25 years earlier of largely cardiovascular disease. Um, and so these things I had noticed early on. And so, you know, I thought, okay, it, it kind of makes sense to call this metabolic psychiatry because metabolism and the brain, uh, metabolic issues and mental health, there is a connection. And we should be thinking about that in conjunction, even in primary care when we're treating depression or we're treating um, mental health conditions. So the focus is maybe diabetes or metabolic syndrome, but there's a huge overlap with the two. And so there are shared genetic and environmental influences as well as other things. And I thought that made sense. And I also felt, because you asked me why I went into it, I also felt that not only does it break down the silo by creating this, uh, you know, attention to the name and the field, um, it's really a place where where patients are looking for care for for these particular issues, and they don't necessarily know where to go or how to get it. And I think this really does create a place for them to be able to do that. So not only attention for medical care, um, but also attention for um, whether it's funding or the other or research, I think it also a calls for for that uh, care that that patients are looking for. And how did you? So you mentioned this. You know, you saw the connection. Both were a metabolic problem with the obesity and with the mental illness. How did you come across keto or ketosis as a potential therapy? Yeah. So in medical school, or at least I was very lucky. I was very fortunate to have the experience of learning about nutrition in medical school, because that's really not something that's typical in medical school to have nutrition and training. And I had uh, several mentors that were obesity medicine physicians at Duke and elsewhere that did employ ketogenic diets in their patients for insulin resistance and diabetes and obesity. And I saw that overlap with psychiatry because a lot of the patients also had psychiatric conditions, but weren't necessarily being noticed, right? In, or addressed because that's their psychiatrist, you know, um, thing to, to focus on. So that's where I felt there was a gap in care. Um, that gap in care I was talking about, that that's where I felt there was a gap in care. But my exposure to a ketogenic diet and the nuances of prescribing a ketogenic diet in this population was early in medical school with folks I trained with um, that I highly respect and uh, have done really great work for thousands of patients. And so from there, um, I continued to learn and kind of created my own pathway and residency as well. Um, so that's, that's how I started. I, I started with a few patients and then I increased it. And then, then I started, uh, you know, uh, getting other people or colleagues referring patients to me early in my training in, in, uh, in residency. And that's when I, I started this pathway to understand also eating disorders and I did additional training in obesity medicine because it's really metabolic medicine. Obesity medicine is metabolic medicine. And that's no matter where it is, it doesn't matter. Uh, to me, it's about understanding and getting the information to whether it's obesity medicine or functional medicine or this, it's really about understanding what is the gap in care and how do I address that gap? So for me, I formed my own like um, concentration is what it, it was called in, in residency in this area. So I created my own curriculum. I had a, I have a tendency to do that. Uh, I did that in college too. I did a, like a history uh, and religious minor at the time because of the politics that was, that, that was going on in 9-11. I was just interested in, in kind of world, 
worldly things. And so uh, I took a break from my biochemistry <laughs> and um, I went to UC Berkeley and I did a, a special project minor. And I created that as an independent study and uh, went to three different institutions to kind of create that together. And I did the same thing for medical school and residency. So it was Stanford, Duke and Hopkins. And so I ultimately went to several places to get the additional training. And I also found that within the Obesity Medicine Association. So I kind of combined that, petitioned it, and it worked out quite well. Um, and that's why I, you know, boarded in these two things, because I did feel like it was going to be very helpful, um, not only for knowledge, but also for credibility and moving forward and starting a clinic and making sure that, uh, you know, people, other providers, other doctors, they also need to feel comfortable with a ketogenic diet approach or um, a metabolic approach within the field of psychiatry, because that's not common, right? There's a very small group of us that do that. So that's that's how I, I approached it um, with board certification and um, understanding the science behind why these things work. So you started the Metabolic Psychiatry Clinic back in 2015 when, you know, it wasn't even a thing you had to make up a name for it what um I, but you also said you, you had other interests like uh, did you say religious studies and history um that you how did you um find space in a place like Stanford to explore all these different elements when many people just go down the same track what was different about your approach that allowed you to carve out this new space for yourself yeah so what allowed for that space was one I I created the space by taking, we have something called independent study time or scholarly concentration time and training. It is a small piece of it. It wasn't enough to just do that. I wanted more time. So what I did was I took, I decreased my time in residency actually just to pursue it, including the research I was doing because I was also a co-investigator on a study that was an FDA approved obesity drug uh, and looking at how that changed eating disorder symptoms in those with binge eating disorder or bulimia nervosa. And it does improve metabolic dysfunction. It does target metabolic dysfunction. And what was so interesting about our study, it was an RCT study, a randomized control trial. What was so interesting is that it decreased binge episodes and purging episodes. So that is a psychiatric outcome that is a real, you know, it's a severe illness and it's a, it's a real change in, in psychiatric outcome. So, and, you know, all metabolic markers as well, but I created the space to do that because it was an interest of mine. I took a salary cut of 50%, but for me, it was a really about the learning of it. Um, I think it's really a unique opportunity to be able to do that as a resident, um, to be involved in, in a RCT study um, like that. And I saw over 50% of the patients in that study for each visit and um, evaluated them, their side effects with the medication, et cetera. So that, I, I think that led me to <laughs> the next study that I did. And uh, that was, you know, non-pharmacological intervention, looking at low carb ketogenic diet in this population, but also in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And that was my um, love, lovely project. And we're almost done with it. We've finished recruiting and we've uh, now we're analyzing the data there. I'm happy to talk more about that as well, but to answer your question, yeah, just, I just had to create space for it and ask the, the right people if it was okay. And so that's the department head. Um, head of GME um, at Stanford. She was actually really supportive, um, allowing me to go to other institutions even to to learn um, additional things. So, did you ever great. did you ever foresee at the time this metabolic psychiatry becoming the movement that it is now? And so many, or did you was it just a, an interest of yours? Did you foresee this, or um, did you hope it would be like this, or was it just an interest you were pursuing for its own sake at the time? You know, I just followed my passion. I had no idea um, 
that it would end up like this, but I'm so happy that it has. I'm so glad that it has been pervasive. The term's been pervasive um, across the community. I think a large community now is, is um, recognizing it as um, you know a subfield, an area of exploration, an area of research. And it really does take a village to make a movement. Um, it's not one person. And so I'm really enthused about it. And I couldn't in my wildest dreams have imagined <laughs> that it would have been like this. I was thinking about you know, building the clinic, treating patients, doing the res some research, right? Um, showing that it's effective. And then going from there, um, I was thinking of building and, and I'm, I'm seriously considering uh, building an educational training fellowship program for, for students um, or, or medical trainees at Stanford. And so that's something that I'm, I'm exploring. We talk a lot about um, trying to get a movement going in psychiatry, metabolic psychiatry, but mm -hmm. I'm just curious about um, the other things you've worked on. Is there any momentum in the keto or low carb world in eating disorders or in obesity right now in the medical establishment? Yeah, that's a good question. So with eating disorders, it's a little tricky because the like hypothesis in eating disorders is that if you, if you restrict diet in any way that exacerbates eating disorder symptoms. So the you know, there's very good intentions behind, um, you know, the, the eating disorder professional world. I think what is missing is that we're not looking at the metabolic dysfunction and how that's, that is related to an eating disorder. And I think that area of exploration needs to be done further. Uh, we did publish a, a case series on some patients that did have uh, actually it was three patients that did see resolution of their symptoms. Um, they had either binge eating disorder or bulimia and comorbid obesity as well. And they underwent a ketogenic diet and they saw improvement in their binge eating. In fact, their binge eating stopped. And so that for a significant period of time, and we follow them up. So, so we wrote up those cases and that is in the International Journal of Eating Disorders. So that was the first part. Um, so after I treated several eating disorder patients, then we looked at the case series. But now the next step is looking at maybe a prospective study. Uh, and so, so now I'm working with um, Agnes Eiten from the UK um, and um, Troll Collegian through Gale, as well as Laura Saslow at University of Michigan. Um, we have a very interested student from Harvard who's interested in looking at this data. And so what we are, are doing now, we just applied for IRB and hoping to get approval any day to analyze that data, uh, to look at this cohort, this population as well, um, to see what the improvement may be in their eating disorder symptoms, specifically I, binge eating. <clears throat> yeah. I commend you for trying to fight the establishment. I realize this is like not, it can be kind of difficult, controversial, you know, therapies to bring up, but maybe, you know, as a segue, you could tell us some of the work you've been doing in metabolic psychiatry, because that's why we're here, I guess. Yeah, of course. And yeah, no, thank you for saying that. It, it, and it is controversial because for so, for so much of what we know, diet, restricting calories, restricting fat um, does exacerbate eating disorder symptoms. But what we have not looked at is it's not, a, all these studies are low fat diets. They're not necessarily low carbohydrate, high fat ketogenic diets, which I do believe is different. It has a different effect on, on the brain, for example. And so that's something that uh, hasn't been explored completely with eating disorders. And we hope we hope uh, to do that. Um, but to get to, I guess, the other work and kind of the main work that I'm focusing on right now is the population of schizophrenia and bipolar illness with the ketogenic diet. And so the study that we're working on is looking at how that affects metabolic 
markers as well as psychiatric markers. So we look at gold standard of care of psychiatric um, assessments, quality of life, mood, and we're also looking at psychosis. So we look at the brief psychosis um, psychiatric symptom scale. And then we're also looking at the biomarkers, the metabolic biomarkers. So inflammation, visceral fat, um, also making sure that even with weight loss, their skeletal muscle mass is being maintained because that's just good metabolic medicine. You don't want to not look at that. Um, and we're looking at lipids and advanced lipids, not just the you know basic panel, but the advanced panel. So looking at all LDL subfractions, really looking at omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. So we're just kind of looking at the gamut of what we can um, to see what with the ketogenic diet, how, how it affects these markers in a population that is most vulnerable and also taking medications, medications like psychotropic medications that at least half the time have metabolic side effects. So on one side of it, the medications can help with, say, for example, lithium can help with insulin signaling, neuronal signaling, but maybe in, you know, with long-term use, maybe with a medic, it may have a different side effect somewhere else or an antipsychotic. I like to call them neuroleptics because I think it's less stigmatizing. Um, and neuroleptic medications have side effects like olanzapine, for example, or Abilify or other medications, risperidone. They can um, increase weight. And we think that it does that in several different ways. And one of those ways while they may be helping in the brain uh, in for one mechanism, a different mechanism, they out perif in the periphery may actually be increasing insulin, for example, or worsening metabolic health by directly acting on peripheral organs like the pancreas or the liver to, to elevate blood glucose. And so there is a really delicate balance of this approach. And I think metabolic health and treatment of metabolic health should be incorporated as part of standard of care and mental health, because it is very complicated. Um, I, I, I try to be really careful because I know it's going around a little bit here and there that you can just get off your medications and you can substitute it with a ketogenic diet. I don't think we're there. Um, and I think it's dangerous to say that because some, these medications are helping people. Um, they are saving lives, reducing suicide. Um, they're, you know, Im improving mania. They, they control a lot of symptoms, um, alleviate a lot of symptoms, of course, not for everybody, but for people who really need it also, they're saving their lives. And so getting them off these medications have to be done or reducing have to be done with a medical provider psychiatrist or other that specializes in this area and also someone that's willing to work with that patient on um, adjusting it to reduce metabolic side effects along with a ketogenic diet. Um, so I think there's a very delicate balance and uh, while medications are helpful in one way, it may not be completely in the other way. And so I think the long-term way, and I think that is where we need to I, you know, understand more about how to mitigate side effects. Clinically, I see that it is helping, especially with the trial. And I can say that now we've completed the um, study, the full analysis, not there, but the preliminary data presented at least two, three times now at conferences. And um, we saw a 30% reduction in visceral fat in four months only. And if you look at the drugs today that are out there in the market for obesity, um, some of them are covered by insurance and some of them are not, you're not necessarily getting or achieving that. Um, maybe with the GLP ones you are, but a lot of the other drugs, you're not achieving that. And I think that's important to understand is that if there is a metabolic intervention, <clears throat> like a ketogenic diet, uh, a metabolic therapy, right? The side effects are quite minimal. The cost is lower than a drug and you're achieving quite a significant improvement in metabolic health. So visceral fat is just one. So fine, let's talk about another one. Um, high sensitivity CRP is another thing we looked at. There was a reduction of 17% um, in four months with that. 
Um, and this is overall, this is not just people. So there are people that we grouped in a category who were adherent, completely adherent, versus people who were not completely adherent, but were adherent at least for 50% of the time. That's more of like a low carb diet versus a ketogenic metabolic therapy. Even those people who are on a low carbohydrate approach actually did have an improvement in all of these markers. So it's not that you're not going to get anything out of it if you're not in ketosis. I do think that there's some benefit on both ends. Um, it's just a matter of maybe the severity of your illness and maybe the type of diagnosis or, um, you know, it, it's almost like a dose response curve in some way, but a study that hasn't been done, but that would be a really good study to do in the future to understand uh, how how much you need to be in therapeutic ketosis levels, for example, to reach the effect that you need. So um, to complete the, the results, besides the metabolic results, there's a, a almost 11% weight reduction, BMI reduction in four months. Um, there was um, psychiatric markers wise, there was an improvement in quality of life by 20%. Um, the CGI, which is a standard scale that we use, um, which stands for clinical global impression, there was a between 20 and 40% improvement in schizophrenia and bipolar illness just, just with this uh, population um, with schizophrenia and bipolar illness. And so that's, I think, very encouraging to me. Um, and I know these patients because I saw all of them. And even subjectively, we don't have a measure or a good scale for energy. <laughs> um, but they would tell me that their energy improved, that they weren't sleeping or taking a nap in the middle of the day. Um, in fact, there was one patient I remember with bipolar illness that in the middle of the day, every day, was an engineer. Um, he every day had a, he had to take a nap and had binge episodes, binge eating. So it's actually high comorbidity um, mm -hmm. eating disorders and bipolar illness. And so that was interesting um, that there was an improvement there mm -hmm. as well with the eating disorder symptom. Um, I had another uh, a patient I'll just mention with schizoaffective who uh, had really great results with uh, weight loss, which she was looking for, but also had significant improvement in paranoia, like thoughts of paranoia, as well as auditory hallucinations, the frequency decreased. Hmm. So imagine there's quality of life improvement just from that. And he also described to me that he was able to take away the negative thoughts more, which was interesting. Like hmm. there was something about this when he started for him that he said that he was able to push back the negative thoughts the negativity the voices that were coming to him and that made a difference for him in being more productive at work because he's um, an engineer he's what he was also an engineer mm. so i'm in silicon valley there's a lot of engineers here so <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's a typical but yeah I, I just thought i'd share that because that was very um it was very nice to hear that there was such a significant improvement um, in quality of life and mood for, so, for some people, yeah. So you were presenting these results at the Milken conference we were at, at in Denver last week and um, before last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite remarkable to me because as a patient with bipolar, you're usually told about how much weight you're going to put on and how many metabolic things are going to go wrong with you on these medications. <laughs> and you were describing that people's metabolic markers were improving, but also their mood was improving, their psychiatric symptoms were improving, which is not a dynamic that we're used to hearing, you know, when you're described treatments for these things. And even, you know, like you say that um, uh, lithium, where I think my opinion is that it has short-term benefits, but in the long-term it's toxic for the kidneys, you get nephrogenic diabetes and syphilis and so forth. And so it's really complicated. Even treatments that can really help in the long run can cause a terrible metabolic problems so it's really it was really encouraging to hear that that is possible that you can not have to trade your physical health for your mental health you know sometimes um someone was saying this on twitter that i think it was chris palmer was saying oh you know you have to trade your mental health for your physical health this is what you described 
um, when you're looking at treatment options, and this is not what you're describing at all, it's an improvement in both at the same time. And I, I can completely relate to what you said about binge eating, but also like wanting to nap, because when I was very ill and depressive episodes, it's so, it's so odd, you have no energy in your body, it feels like you're underwater, and you can't breathe. And you like you've run a marathon and you're just trying to it's almost like you're paused in that state of having run a marathon and the exhaustion you have at the end of it it's just like paused in time so over the course of you know weeks you feel this state of exhaustion but it never goes away and um but then you also still want to eat more which makes no sense to me you know you, you're you can't exert energy but you also want to intake more energy do you, do you think this points to a feature of bipolar that is the body's just you're giving it plenty of energy it's just not able to generate ATP or energy from the food that you're putting do you think that's what we're looking at yeah and it's and that's a great question because you know there's been a lot of really great researchers um, over the last hundred plus years who have looked at uh, mitochondrial metabolism and brain health and in fact uh, I spoke to one of the researchers who was at the Milken uh, meeting and I spoke to the on the phone with her the other day and she was talking about the evidence for it and you know it is actually um, so she did this work which was specifically looking at ATP metabolism uh, Krebs cycle metabolism ATP consumption so it's the rate of consumption of the energy is different um, in bipolar illness versus healthy controls. Um, and that's really interesting that there is such a difference. Um, so the other part that I thought was interesting is that those with bipolar disorder have 20, they're 20 times more likely to have um, that coming from a mitochondrial disease. Right. Mm -hmm. So a mitochondrial disease, like a DNA mutation or um, encephalomyopathy or ophthalmoplegia, you're mm -hmm. more likely to, to get bipolar illness if you have a mitochondrial issue. So mm -hmm. there is a connection there as well. Um, and we do know that with in mental illness in general, mm -hmm. there are differences in um the mitochondrial metabolism, we think, right? Um, the energy consumption. And she she told me also that it's very important to understand that there's a distinction between ATP generation and ATP consumption. So this is kind of the latest uh, piece because I think we were thinking ATP generation was different, but it's actually the consumption of ATP that's different. So the metabolism is different. And there may be uh, deficits in certain enzymes as well, like PDC, um, you know, complex pyruvate dehydrogenase. And we know also that even just biogenesis of mitochondria is different. So that's the mitochondrial piece and energy metabolism. But there are a lot of other things too, um, like inflammation, neuroinflammation, um, oxidative stress, the environmental burden on the cell being different, um, functional connectivity between different brain regions, which is another, there's an RCT uh, Judith Ford is doing, and uh, I'm also helping with that study and as a consultant. And so they're going to be looking at functional MRI data and looking at the difference. Um, and Ian, you, you um, uh, are also working on a, a, a trial as well. And so, you know, all I think that this field is skyrocketing. I mean, the number of studies that people are planning and doing um, are just amazing. And there's also a study that we're planning at Stanford um, with a colleague of mine that does TMS um, burst, five day theta burst. And he was at the meeting as well and kind of looking at, um, that was Nolan Williams. He's also looking at um, comparing and we we're discussing comparing the, the procedure along with com combination with the ketogenic diet to sustain the effects of the theta burst. So we're looking at that versus just theta burst alone. And oh. so we're going to recruit for that next year. And so there are a lot of different, I think, angles of research that can be done that are actually quite fascinating. So it's really about getting the patient with acute bipolar mania, for example, stabilized um, with the theta burst. And then does the ketogenic diet help with kind of more maintenance of that um, effect 
which is a very different study than looking at just outpatient um, population, right? These are the kind of studies I really wanted to see when I was about 10 years ago, when there was just nothing hopeful on the horizon for it. This is really exciting. I mean, combining TMS with ketogenic diet is so innovative and, um, you know, both working on some aspects of metabolism in the brain. So it's very, um, I think like for so long, um, you know, in the past we were put on insulin shock therapy, you know, if we were around sort of 60 or 70 years ago, and then I think it was the 1960s, they were doing that. And then it kind of, there was a lot of treatments that were very, uh, you know, traumatic for people to go through electroconvulsive therapy, obviously it works, but um, not pleasant to experience combining insulin shock therapy with electroconvulsive therapy, also not very pleasant to experience. But uh, but even now, the medications, I, f- I feel like when you're talking about um, TMS plus uh, ketogenic diet, this feels like an era of kind of treatment, even to the medications we have at the moment, which are very difficult for people when I go to support groups or speak to friends of bipolar. They just a lot of them feel so sedated. And like you say, they are life saving in many acute circumstances. But in the long run, it's just so difficult to function and to have any kind of quality of life. On some of the, um, you know, I've experienced it with lamotrigine, which can be remarkable for some people. For me, it was, uh, it was, I couldn't think, I just couldn't use my mind in any way to be useful in life, which was really, um, so it's just very exciting to hear about these new approaches. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think, do you feel like this represents a new era of treating uh, these conditions and how, what kind of timeline do you think we're on? Yeah, I I do think it's a new era of treatment. And the reason why I say that is because in psychiatry, in our field, we focused on, you know, very few mechanisms. We looked at like neurotransmitter, like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, um, and drugs that target these receptors, right? And beyond that, you know, we're just at this kind of new burgeoning era of looking at other mechanisms. And I think ketogenic metabolic therapy is one of those treatments that that are looking at different mechanisms in fact multiple mechanisms in ketones use different transporters to get into the cell than um, glucose does and it's also it circumvents metabolism in the way that glucose uh, normally um, does right so it's it's a different pathway altogether and the brain isn't especially as you age and with illness, it's not able to to metabolize glucose as well. Um, And so Stephen Kinane's research has shown that, and he did look at uh, specific ketones or MCT to see if there was an improvement with mild cognitive impairment in over six months, and that was an RCT that showed an improvement. So these things um, are really important that cerebral glucose hypometabolism issue, if this metabolic therapy can circumvent that, then that's a different mechanism altogether than what we're doing with SSRIs and SNRIs or neuroleptics. Um, And there's been so much literature as well and research in the epilepsy field with pediatric epilepsy, as you know, with ketogenic metabolic therapy being very effective. Um, once the drugs came out, like valproate um, or lamotrigine and, you know, other drugs, um, then it was less popular, less known. Um, so I think I think in the field of mental health, we need to do, um, you know, a, a, an improved job of, of that, of education, awareness, research. And I do think that it is accelerating at a pace that I had no... Um, idea that it would. Um, and it has a lot to do, Matt, also with your um, y- your mom has single-handedly accelerated this field. Um, and it's really wonderful um, that she's doing that. And it's rare, uh, I think, in science for that to happen. I think we did see that, you know, with cardiovascular disease and cancer in, in some ways, because the government got involved too, right? But I think this is an area that has been underutilized or understudied, and now uh, hopefully we'll be accelerating that. So it's a very exciting time. I think Jan saw me go through this and go through, you know, these waves of psychosis and was trying everything and so many medications and every psychiatrist and the psych wards and looking for a solution and we couldn't find one. And then when she stumbled on Chris in 2020 and like we, we did this and the effects were so tremendous on what they did for me. 
in terms of going from like, you know, 20 milligrams of olanzapine to like, I'm on 2.5 now and I'm hoping to get off it. And I, and when I think about it, I think about the effects on my metabolism, taking that much Zyprexa, it's really kind of a, a pernicious thing because on the one hand, it was the only thing that could bring me back to sanity. But at the same time I would gain weight and I was drinking like root beers every day in the ward. You know, it's a very, it's a very hard thing. Um, but we, I remember it's so funny. There was one psychiatrist when I was in the psych ward who attributed my recurrent episodes to a tr- problems or um, chaos in the home, which first of all, there was no chaos in the home. Second of all, it's just preposterous to me. Now, when, when I look at this, I hear about this and I, the metabolic markers and the energy imbalance to attribute this to some sort of psychological problem. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And we've been doing this for, you know, centuries, then it's not the problem. It's an imbalance. And if you just change the diet or, you know, fix a couple of things, you could, you potentially reverse and maybe it has nothing to do with psychology or the home life or maybe it does a little bit. I have no idea. I'm not a scientist, but you know, it was just crazy to me. And looking back, it's even more crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your experience. And I, I think, um, mental health professionals, psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, clinical psychologists all have a really good intention. Um, cause we do see, uh, I'll speak from my, my experience professionally is that we do see stress and things in the home do affect, uh, these things It can trigger, it can trigger potentially an episode. It could, um, it could worsen mood, you know, obviously, and, and there may be biological reasons for that or physiological reasons for that with increased cortisol, or maybe blood glucose gets elevated. I'm giving a total hypothesis here, right? But the biopsychosocial model is still a model I, I believe in. And I think it needs to take into account, um, we need to take into account everything that's happening because psychiatric illness is very heterogeneous. We don't have like one smoking gun uh, of like, this is the one biomarker or like the one mechanism that's causing the illness, right? And so it may be a combination of things. Um, Maybe it's a combination of metabolic deficits or metabolism deficits, or maybe it's a combination of that and other things. We found the serotonin hypothesis, right? But that's one hypothesis. There's, there are other things. Um, and how are all these things connected is still, is still something we need to figure out. Um, but I feel like we're getting, you know, towards that, <laughs> at least we know clinically it's helping our patients, um, but we need to understand why and mechanistically exactly why. And that's, uh, that's been researched heavily, but we still need to know more. Um, and that's, that's, that's where, that's my opinion. Um, and I think one thing with the Milken Institute meeting recently, um, I felt very humbled by so many researchers that have been working on this for decades, um, cause of bipolar illness or, uh, and the fact that after I presented the data, I mean, I, I felt very encouraged by people's response to it and understanding of this is something to keep researching and understanding more. And and it was very, I just found it very encouraging. And so I felt very humbled by that. And I will add the Hippocratic oath that we did take, uh, every medical student does take, at least we did at Duke. Um, In the Hippocratic oath, it is actually said, I will use those dietary regimens, which will benefit my patients according to my greatest ability and judgment. And I will do no harm or injustice to them, mm. <clears throat> which I think is so powerful. I mean, we remember first do no harm, yeah. but do we remember I will use wow. dietary regimens? I don't think we remember that. <laughs> so I wanted to bring that up because I thought that was fascinating that even back then that was, it was valued. And I think we need to bring nutrition back into the value of medicine for all like conditions. It's not just mental illness, but for everything. Wow. That is, you never hear that part quoted, you know, like I've never heard that recited in, in years, all my family are doctors and nurses and I never, and it's always the do no harm. Um, that's incredible. 
but and I think I think um you know what you're saying about this the psychosocial biological model is kind of when you suffer from this like Matt was saying you know you're told it could be a, a psychological thing it's so funny like it's so funny to hear that uh told to you because you're literally your your body is plunging into this physiological crisis in these states that you go through that is so extreme that it feels like you're it's not under your control and to say that this is caused by you know um you know some uh, childhood trauma or something is of course like factors like a crossover between biology and psychology and there are things that can cause metabolic dysfunction you know that are cortisol related and so forth but it's just um to hear uh, that this is like a psychological thing is 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 kind of, and but what you're talking about in terms of like your whole body health and your metabolic function it feels much more intuitively true as someone with bipolar that this is this is what it really is it's not about feeling happy and sad it's about the way the energy in your body is being regulated and it's dysregulated in bipolar so um yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge what you said. It's 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 completely through Matt and Jan's energy that this is moving forward, and through people like yourself finding this metabolic psychiatry clinic in two thousand fifteen when this wasn't even a thing. And it and I think that requires so much courage from Matt sharing his story and from you finding this field when nobody else was even talking about this. So I just want to acknowledge how much courage has gone into starting this from everyone involved in this. That it's it's really been people who've stuck their neck out and took a risk uh, because they care about patients. And it's something we've seen in the podcast again and again that it's people who really listen to and appreciate their patients that that move this forward. So thank you for all that you've done in that respect and for for taking a step to to move this forward. Because goodness knows how long it might have been um, if you hadn't done. So uh, it's very, but it's it's exciting and it's it really feels like things are changing. And so. Um, I, I'm very excited to hear the results of the trial and to hear, um, and we'll be presenting ours also uh, around the same time. And it's just going to be very, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a good era for people with these conditions. And I'm very excited about it. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. I uh, will just kind of explain that. So the psychological piece, I, I don't know that that it necessarily causes something like bipolar illness, but it was more of that. I do think psychological. I, I think tr trauma or um, really major life events can affect the body. Um, it can affect the mind too. So I, I do believe that, and I, I do believe that um, these things we should be working on all fronts to help a patient if there are you know psychological trauma or issue, because I do believe in psychotherapy um, and. There's actually research that has been done on looking at how psychotherapy actually affects the brain. And we didn't talk about neuronal growth or plasticity or functional connectivity as much, but um, these things do change like food, nutrition affects structure and function of the brain. Like that we know. Psychotherapy also can uh, affect that too in the brain. And so I do think all of these things are important to consider. And when we think about, you know, even like ACE scores, um, adverse childhood events, for example, um, those people tend to be more treatment resistant. They develop disease and tend to be more treatment resistant. That's what the research shows. So why are they more treatment resistant? Why is it harder to treat their illness compared to someone else? And so there is something happening in the body that is different. And even there's epigenetic change. There's been really great data. Rachel Yehuda has looked at Holocaust uh, survivors and their uh, family and progeny and so forth and looked at epigenetic changes that you actually do carry genetically um, the trauma, say that your parents had, you're you're carrying that also some, genetically somehow. There are changes, and so I do think all of this matters. Um, so being open minded about all of that, I think, can be helpful with with um, with treatment. When yeah. when a patient comes to me, I will consider like trauma being significant in their life. Also, um, not to say that that's like the direct cause of their yeah. bipolar illness, but that it can that it can affect things. Um, I, so. I can, yeah, I, I can agree more when you wear a CGM, one of the things that can spike your glucose just as much as a Mars bar is getting a very, you know, stressful email or having, you know, some kind of situation, you know, yeah. psychological things can make your blood sugar fluctuate almost as much as, 
you know uh things that you eat and so that definitely is is a factor in it and um it's just so funny this uh like almost it's almost like a cartesian split between the mind and the body that we went with uh, we applied to science where we look we gave these people will look at their brain these people look at the body and i think someone i think it was uh was it george who said uh you know we've proven conclusively that the the brain is indeed a part of the body you know it's it's, it's the money that there was yeah. this kind of, uh, hyper specialization that led to this and and has been so detrimental to patients so it's very exciting to see this uh gap being bridged and um and, and thank you for doing that and I, I suppose it's because of this unusual training that you had this double certification of bc medicine and in uh, psychiatry that allowed you to kind of start making these links um so what uh, what do you feel excited about in terms of the future of um uh, i want to be respectful of your time we have a couple of minutes left but what do you feel excited about in the future of metabolic psychiatry um what are the things that make you feel like this is going to be uh, a really interesting exciting field for the next 10 20 years well one thing is that the research is accelerating uh, I I feel like it's, it's happening very quickly, which I think is the really exciting part also, because originally when I started, I thought, oh, you know, it takes a couple of years to do a clinical trial, um, then I'll do the next one, that will be another couple of years. But the fact that there's five, four or five groups now, and we're simultaneously doing things, um, I'm wrapping up this trial now, but going on to the next and involved with some of these groups, it feels very encouraging um, with the acceleration. And I think the future of metabolic psychiatry is going to be in different areas. It's going to be research, it's going to be clinical care, it's going to be community movement, um, education, awareness. There are so many different areas for this to go, um, but it doesn't need to happen um, you know, one and then the next one, it can happen all in parallel. And I think that's what's really exciting about how in the for the future, in the near future, that this can then be integrated into standard of care um, with mental health. And I also think that not just that, but even just training the future generation. Um, so that fellowship piece that I was talking about, I think is an accredited fellowship that's recognized is, I think, important for moving the field forward. And not only that, but to move the field forward, research and data is needed, in addition to uh, even a consensus amongst researchers, uh, you know, those in the community that are respected and have done a lot of uh, work in this area as well. And so, I'm working along with 12 other co-authors, including yourself, Ian, on a, you know, positional statement about metabolic psychiatry um, as an umbrella term to describe the treatment of metabolic dysfunction to improve psychiatric outcomes, whether it's central or, or peripheral. Uh, and so, Ian, you're you're on the cutting edge of, you know, the being a pioneer in this space and um, working on this research trial that that you're doing and i think uh the future is also with all of you <laughs> um and I, th I think it's a wonderful thing to have a definitional uh statement or paper because that does mean a lot for the credibility for our field in psychiatry i have a lot of friends who have seen me get better on this diet and i am very outspoken about the fact that i attribute you know, the bulk of the, of my mood stability to the diet, in addition with a lot of other lifestyle habits. At the same time, it seems like no one really believes me. I almost feel like I know that the earth revolves around the sun and no one else does, mm -hmm. or maybe no one cares. I have no idea, but even people who have serious mental illnesses want to, you know, keep eating their vegan diets and not eat any fat. So, um, how do you, last question from me, how do you deal with, um, the challenge of, you know, working in a field where maybe not everybody is not necessarily on board? That's an excellent question. So I've had mixed experiences. Some people are very open to it and some people are, are not open to it and feel it's dangerous. And ultimately, uh, the way that I approach it is one, there's been a lot of data on the ketogenic diet already with epilepsy uh, research neurological conditions. I actually find most neurologists to be super open-minded about it. 
um, and very encouraging. Um, there's a, when I treat someone's patient, whether it's an internist or a cardiologist or a, another psychiatrist, when I treat their patient, then they feel differently. So if they're not on board 100% in the beginning, that's okay. They will learn one patient at a time, education. And that's what's the beautiful part of being in a health system that you have multiple uh, you know, specialties and doctors and clinics is because we refer people to each other. I usually get the referral since it's a metabolic psychiatry, it's a subspecialty clinic. And then I'm helping this patient and they're getting better. And then they see that and they're more open to it, right? Because all the cardiovascular risk markers are improving. Um, their mental health is improving. So they're happy, right? And that's that's important. The patient is happy. The other doctors are happy and that helps. Um, and in terms of education, I, I do it one step at a time, you know, um, and a lot of it has to do with coordination of care, citing papers in my Epic notes, for example, <laughs> uh, you know, that's our electronic medical record, um, you know, putting, putting that and, and people know I'm doing research in that area too. So I think, I think that helps too. Um, so, so having that, um, uh, trust. I think is important. And in terms of the other diets, you know, I, I don't, I don't uh, vilify any other diet. I, I say, you know, it's a personal choice. Um, this is the data for this. This is data for this. Um, this is what I've seen clinically work. Um, when I have a patient with anorexia, I really try to get them to increase fat, for example, um, because they feel like low fat is better for them to lose weight because that's the dogma. That's like what's been taught as low fat to lose weight. So then I do that education on myelin and the brain and increasing fat and things improve. Um, you know, patient had a menstrual cycle disruption and period came back when she had more fat, that kind of thing and saturated fat specifically. Uh, and so things like that, I think can be helpful because once people see the improvement, then they are more on board and then they're more curious as to, well, why is this working? How is this working? Um, and there's a lot of myths, a lot of myths that people believe and you have to kind of de disentangle it. Yeah. Takes energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, Thank you very much for speaking to us today. And um, how can people find out um, more about your work? What's the best place to visit and to find you on Twitter and social media? Yeah, that's a good question. I, mean, I would say just uh, go to metabolicpsychiatry.com. You can find me on Stanford uh, website as well. Um, I have a Twitter at ShibaniMD is my Twitter um, name. And metabolicpsychiatry.com is, is just a it's a free resource website that we've, um, that are, it's run on volunteers. I don't take any, um, you know, money from it. We're not trying to make anything off. This It's just a free resource that we are providing to the community. And we're trying to update it um, as we can with the latest research and what metabolic psychiatry clinics that you can go to, et cetera. So um, that's where I would say go first. And there's a contact us page that you can just click on and we're keeping a database for, for people and helping triage them to where they can go cool. at this point. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on the podcast. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you both. Take care.